come this evening to Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 21. And our theme this evening is just simply the, the opening words of this chapter, Does not wisdom call? Does not wisdom call? One of the many quirks that my wife has discovered about me in nearly nine years of marriage is that, according to her anyway, according to her, if we're out somewhere, I often think I see someone we know, and it almost never is someone we know. So I'll suddenly say, is that Garth McKeeman over there? And almost invariably, maybe from a distance it looked like Garth, but it wasn't Garth. And this gives my wife great amusement every time it happens. Uh, there have been two main pictures so far in Proverbs, the picture of the two paths and the picture of the two women. And as I mentioned earlier, we've thought quite a bit about one of those two women in the chapters already, the foreign woman, the woman who wants to entice and tempt into sin. But chapter 8 describes another woman, a woman called Wisdom. And like the foreign adulterous woman, this woman Wisdom calls out she makes offers and appeals to those who would hear her. And the challenge comes for interpreters because this woman looks and sounds an awful lot like someone that we know. She looks and sounds an awful lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. And this causes, as you can imagine, a great degree of discussion and going back and forth and quoting all kinds of other commentators amongst the commentators. But just look, for example, on down at some verses we didn't read. Uh, Proverbs 8, verse 27, which God willing will come to uh, next week. Proverbs 8, 27. When he established, this is wisdom speaking. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle in the face of the deep. Verse 30. I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight. This woman wisdom claims to have been there in some sense at the creation of the world. And those words might make us think of how John's gospel begins. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All things were made through him, that is through the Lord Jesus. Or notice chapter 8 verse 35. Wisdom says, whoever finds me finds life. And obtains favor from the Lord. And the Lord Jesus says in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the woman wisdom looks and sounds a lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think the, the most helpful way to think of it, friends, is that in the same way that when we read the story of Joseph in Genesis, Joseph often looks a lot like Jesus in what he says and does. Or in First and Second Samuel, King David often looks and maybe sometimes even acts a lot like Jesus. Or you could even argue in the book of Esther, Queen Esther at times, in the position that she's put into and in the things that she does resembles the Lord Jesus. Well, so here in Proverbs 8, this picture of a woman called wisdom crying out to passers-by, really does look a lot like the Lord Jesus. And this is how we often understand the Old Testament, isn't it? That, that it's full of pictures. We were reading even there of the tabernacle. God willing, next time we'll read about the, the priestly garments. And we'll see how those priestly garments are, are a picture for us of Christ and his work and of his people, the church. And that's how the Old Testament is to be understood, not just as uh, unique or individual stories or people or objects in and of themselves, but a signpost towards Jesus himself. And here in Proverbs 8, it's this woman called Wisdom. And so we want to notice four things about this woman Wisdom that Solomon describes for us. Four things that she has in common, we might say, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, uh, we, we see from chapter 8 that wisdom calls publicly. Wisdom calls publicly. This is verses 1 to 8. Now if you look at chapter 8, verse 1. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice on the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, beside the gates, at the entrance of the portals? She cries aloud. <clears throat> Just as he's been doing all through these first nine chapters, the father is telling his sons that 
uh, they will find themselves walking on the way, and the way is a picture of the journey of life. And just as we saw in previous chapters how the foreign woman, the, the temptress, will not be hard to find. It won't be hard to, to hear her. She will be right there on the way of life. So also the father says, in more encouraging news, that the woman wisdom will also be right there on the way of life. She is widely, freely, publicly available. She's on the heights, verse 2, the prominent places, in other words. You can't miss her. She's at the crossroads. She's beside the gate. If you think back to the book of Ruth that we studied a few years ago, which I'm sure you know well, uh, you remember that when Boaz came out to arrange for the, re the redeeming of Ruth, uh, the transaction that he carried out, that it was done at the city gate. The gate was where people gathered. It was where you met your friend and went off for a walk, or it was where the city elders met to carry out important decisions. And in those days too, the crossroads, which is mentioned here, that's where you met all kinds of people. Maybe a weary traveler would stop for the night at the crossroads. Merchants and vendors and sellers would set themselves up for business at the crossroads, knowing there's going to be plenty of footfall, there's going to be people coming and going. This is a good place to make plenty of money. Uh, last Thursday morning, some of my fellow ministers and I were making our way through uh, Liverpool Airport, and we inevitably then had to walk through the duty-free area where you get bombarded with perfume smells and food smells. Um, I don't think any of the staff were crying out to us, but they didn't really need to because capitalism was just bombarding us right in the face and the smell was hitting us as soon as we turned the corner into the corridor. And there's nowhere else to go, of course. You have to walk through the duty-free. Um, there it was, all those products right in our face. The father here is telling his sons it'll be the same for you. Yes, there's going to be the temptress and all these other ways that you could go, but there's also going to be this woman wisdom. You can't miss her. She cries out to you in the journey of life and at the crossroads of life. She is freely offering herself to you. Look at verse 4. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. <clears throat> Wisdom calls to the children of men, to human beings, and offers them what is right in a world tempting them into what is wrong. True wisdom is choosing the truth of God over the lies of the world. We've seen that over and over again in the book of Proverbs. True wisdom is love and respect for God and his word and a conscious turning away from what is false and evil. True wisdom is obedience to the commands of God and trusting that those commands really do lead to life where these other things will lead to death. Foolishness is ignoring the commands of God. Foolishness is sin. And having extensively warned his sons about the dangers of the foreign sinful woman and how she will be public and unmissable, the father then also balances that with encouragement. This woman wisdom will also be unmissable, calling out and offering you life. And this is the first way in which the picture of the woman wisdom reminds us of someone we know. Because the Lord Jesus, friends, publicly calls out to us, to, to men and women and boys and girls. Remember, we saw it at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, how Jesus stepped forward to begin his public ministry. And how did he begin it? He began it by calling out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preaching is, is publicly calling, publicly proclaiming a message and particularly on the Lord's Day, but at other times as well, as God's people continue on the journey of life with our unbelieving family, our unbelieving neighbors, the Lord Jesus, through us, is calling out to sinners. As the Apostle Paul once said, as he himself was preaching, he is not far 
from any one of us. In fact, the history of the church shows us that when men have tried to suppress the call of Christ most, most viciously, most uh, uh, eagerly and earnestly, the call of Christ has just got all the louder. You might think of China today where the government has been harassing and imprisoning and pressuring Christians for a generation or two now. Churches just keep getting planted. Pastors just keep getting trained. People just keep on hearing the good news. There are probably more Christians of the same denomination as us in China, more Christians in there, than there have been in our denomination for generations in this part of the world. And of course, friends, as members of the church, we're to play our part in this. We're to make sure that insofar as it depends on us, humanly speaking, the call of Jesus is loudly, publicly heard in Dromore, in Northern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, as far afield as we can support and aid the call of the gospel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 15 to 16, we are the aroma of Christ, just like the duty-free shops place their products where everyone gets hit with the aroma. Paul says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, the other a fragrance from life to life. We know that not everyone who hears the call of, of Christ, of, of wisdom personified, we know that not everyone will heed it, but we know that those who are going to be saved will be saved because they heard the call of the gospel. And so we continue, and so we proclaim Christ, and we trust that his call will go out effectually toward his people. Wisdom calls publicly. Secondly, wisdom calls persuasively. Wisdom calls persuasively. Uh, verses 9 to 14. Uh, if you just look at verses 8 to 11, he's, uh, Solomon here, speaking of the woman wisdom, says, All the words of my mouth uh, are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. The woman wisdom here compares herself to the other things on offer at the crossroads, on the heights, in the city gates. And she makes a persuasive case that we would be wasting our time if we chase after any of them whilst neglecting her. Notice the contrast between wisdom and and the ways of the world here, verse 8. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. We probably all know what it's like to get some wonderful sounding offer made to us on the phone or on the street or online. And a good rule of thumb, of course, is that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Oftentimes we just have a nagging sense that someone is twisting their words. There's probably things they're not saying. They're, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not going over the small print. Their words aren't really trustworthy. And that is the case even for so many good things that we often enjoy, friends, that they're built up and hyped up. This, this match, this experience, this person is going to be the best thing ever. And then it often falls flat. And in contrast, wisdom is not like that. All my words are righteous, she says. One commentator says, part of wisdom's reliability is her rejection of everything that is opposite of truth. <coughs> Crooked and perverse, those words that are used there, both depict twistedness and contortedness of speech, she says. It bends the truth, bends the truth, either by deliberate misstatement or by conscious omission of relevant facts. That's an interesting phrase, phrase. Conscious omission of relevant facts. Or we even have had in recent years alternative facts uh, presented. That's how they're sometimes described. How many people are being exploited in our culture today by either deliberate misstatement or conscious omission of relevant facts? We're in an election year, both in our own country 
There's also going to be the presidential election in the United States. And there will be a lot of conscious omission of relevant facts. Politicians promise, promising us the earth when in fact they're able to deliver so little. And it's not just in the realm of politics or culture. I was talking to one pastor last week who said that he had had Jehovah's Witnesses at his door recently. I said, nice for some. In nine years of being in ministry, I'm yet to be able to start talking to Jehovah's Witnesses at my door. I think they must know where I live. Uh, but this pastor got chatting to them about Jesus, and they said, oh, we believe in Jesus too. And the pastor said, no, you don't. Don't stand there and claim that you believe in Jesus. You don't believe in what Jesus says about himself, that he's the first and the last, that he's eternally God who became a man. You don't believe that his death on the cross takes away all your sin, past, present, and future. You believe that his death on the cross has given you a blank slate and that there's more for you to do if you want to get to the, the heaven of heavens. You don't believe that your faith assures you of heaven at all. He said, now I'm happy to talk to you about these things. And they did get their Bibles out and talk about a few things. But he said, we can't pretend that we believe the same things. And it's not just cults and false religions that twist the truth or use crooked speech. It's going on all around us. Truth twisting is especially a threat to our young people. You'll be happier if you look like this. You'll be happier if you have this many followers. You will be truly content with a body like his or a body like hers or a, or a relationship with that person. Truth twisting is at rampant levels on social media as people retreat more and more into their echo chambers and just listen to opinions that agree with the opinions they already have and as they listen to so-called news presenting alternative facts. Wisdom, however, is different. Wisdom invites us to choose between the crooked ways of this world that have disappointed us and the truth of God that truly liberates us. Look at verse 13. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech. I hate. Friends, we could meditate on that verse alone for a lot longer. Can we truly say that we hate perverted speech and the way of evil? Or are there bits, of, bits and pieces of it from the world that we are tolerating in our lives, in our thinking, in our own words? Notice the contrast, however, with wisdom. Verse 14, I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. Wisdom, insight, and strength. There's wisdom, this woman, once again, looking an awful lot like someone we know. Wisdom is calling to you persuasively today. The Lord Jesus is calling to you to consider what political party, what social media influencer, what product that you've purchased has truly spoken nothing but truth and blessing into your life? What crooked words have you believed and been betrayed by? What pride or arrogance or evil are you guilty of or have you been hurt by? Who or what has promised you so much and delivered you so little? Wisdom hides nothing. The Lord Jesus Christ hides nothing from you. Not like cults with their made up Bible translations or their false claims about the origins of the universe or of Christ himself. Christ doesn't hide things. The true church of Jesus Christ doesn't hide things or manipulate things about him. He calls out publicly. He calls out persuasively in the city gate. And he says, in the place where you go to make your decisions, at the crossroads of life, there I will be. And you can choose life and you can choose wisdom because I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls. 
unlike the scammers and keyboard warriors and influencers of our world, Jesus has nothing to hide and everything to give. He calls you, to pers he calls you persuasively today to follow him. How are you going to answer? Wisdom calls publicly. Wisdom calls persuasively. Thirdly, wisdom calls to princes, prime ministers, and presidents. Wisdom calls to princes, prime ministers, and presidents. This is verses 15 and 16 in particular. Verse 15, wisdom says, By me kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule, and nobles, all who govern justly. We believe as Christians, of course, that every ruler, every national leader in our world, even the horrible ones, the dictators and the tyrants and the corrupt, they are all there and they are only there in the will of God. God raises them up. God can bring them down. And so on a general level, we can say uh, this verse is telling us kings reign. Rulers make decrees. But actually the passage is saying more than that. Wisdom here is calling out and saying that kings and rulers and presidents and prime ministers can only make truly wise decisions. They can only rule well. They can only do good for their citizens if they rely upon the wisdom of God. And if you don't believe that, see, for example, Western Europe today, where so few rulers at the highest levels of national government do rely upon the wisdom of God. And see the turmoil that our societies are in. What is wisdom according to the book of Proverbs? It's the fear of the Lord. It's reverence for God. It's worship of God. It's attention paid to the commandments of God. We've considered a few times throughout the book of Proverbs the close connection it has with the book of Deuteronomy. The law of God given to that new generation of Israelites as they prepared to enter the promised land. Proverbs 7 verse 1 for example. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Very similar language to Deuteronomy 6, 1-6. to True wisdom is love, attention, concern to obey the commandments of God because those commandments are life-giving. And if that is true of the every man, you and I, ordinary citizens, as we travel along the way of life and as we go in and out of the city gate, how much more is it true for those who rule over the city gates? If we ordinary citizens living our ordinary little lives need wisdom, how much more do those who govern us and make decisions for us and who rule over us need this wisdom? These verses are telling us no more and no less than what the rest of Scripture teaches that if we want good government, if we want a healthy society, it starts with those in government bowing the knee to God and humbly asking God for the wisdom that they need. And yet how many of our rulers are doing that? How many of our MPs or MLAs begin the day, I wonder, praying the kind of prayer Solomon prayed in 1 Kings 3, give me wisdom that I may rule well. Some of them do, for which we can be very thankful. But the evidence would suggest that a great many don't. And it just leads to the kind of utter foolishness that we've been seeing in our nation for decades now. The kind of foolishness that was on display just last week when all kinds of supposed experts call for a ban on parents physically disciplining their children, as God's word commands, in a restrained, self-controlled, limited fashion. Our simple-minded culture calls that child abuse, whilst at the same time permitting the destruction of babies that are still in their mother's womb and calling it health care. So a smack in the hand is child abuse. The destruction of a life in the womb is health care. That's where a society that ignores the wisdom of God and indulges in its own pride and foolishness, that's where it ends up. Not just our rulers, but so many of our 
fellow citizens, full of pride and arrogance. Verse 13, they're swayed by crooked and perverted speech. They do not humble themselves and ask for God's wisdom. Unless we look only to the world, we need to look to ourselves. I admit that often as church leaders, as parents, as church members, we're not often enough asking for the wisdom that we need either. But it is interesting that wisdom calls out, particularly just at this juncture, to kings and rulers. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. And what's the reason that Paul says we're to pray for them? So that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's not saying that we want a good government so Christians can just keep our heads down and never put our heads above the parapet and never say or do anything that anybody takes notice of. It's saying we want good government so that we are free to loudly and clearly proclaim the gospel, unhindered by the foolishness of a pagan government. Paul goes on, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved, including kings and rulers and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so friends, we ought to pray far more regularly than we do, and I speak to my, myself first in that, but we ought to pray far more regularly for those who rule us. We've got a Christian Institute week of prayer coming up. We'll make use of that, and we'll pray for our rulers. We ought to pray specifically, as Paul commands us here, that they, like so many, would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth so that they do rule justly and ask for the wisdom that they need. Politicians in recent months have become fond of justifying whatever policy position they've been taking by declaring, this is the right thing to do. They'll be asked an interview, what, what are you doing this for? And they say, well, we believe this is the right thing to do. Well, as one preacher has said, the question arises, who says so? Who says that it's the right thing to do? To what higher authority is that politician appealing? How do they know that they're in the right? They will only know if they're asking for the wisdom of God. And so we ought to pray that they will and that we too will pray for the wisdom that we need. James 1, 5, verse that has meant a lot more to me in parenting years. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. That's a promise not just for politicians who lack wisdom, but as I say, for parents, for church elders and deacons and young people making life-changing decisions and Christians with opportunities to witness to their family or friends. God will give us the wisdom that we need if we ask. So wisdom calls publicly, wisdom calls Persuasively, wisdom calls to presidents and princes and prime ministers. And fourthly and finally, wisdom calls promising blessing. Wisdom calls promising blessing. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield and choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Here's the theme of the book coming out again, friends. Wisdom leads to life. Wisdom leads to blessing. God's way and God's word are priceless. And in the Old Testament era, in that earlier stage of redemptive history, God would use literal wealth and, and literal children and families and inheritance. He would put those things in the hands of his people as a picture for them of everlasting wealth and everlasting family and inheritance. We've seen that, for example, uh, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. All of those men, wealthy men. All of those men promised your offspring will be like the sand of the seashore. And we've been seeing how that began to snowball in the time of Jacob. Their temporary earthly riches in the Old Testament are a picture for us of eternal prosperity, which will far outstrip the prosperity that they had. 
And so we know that when we, perhaps we go without those things on this earth, as, as many Christians do, we don't get discouraged, we don't give up. We know that wisdom leads to life. Wisdom leads to this glorious inheritance. Jesus Christ, of course, himself didn't live on this earth with wealth or children of his own or land of his own. He had none of those things. But we know by faith in him and in his finished work that all of those things are his now. Spiritual offspring, as Isaiah 53 spoke about him. The inheritance of heaven, the inheritance of the nations. Jesus is the richest king who has ever or will ever live. And that's why back in Proverbs 4 verse 7, the father urges his son, get wisdom. Whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. She will give you your wealth sooner or later. Wisdom calls out to his friends and it promises us blessing. Wealth in the fullest sense, not just in the financial sense. And again, this is in the face of all that the world offers us. All that the world says for us to get and to indulge in. Which leaves us feeling, if only I had this, or if only I had that. And the truth is, none of it is ever enough. And none of it ever satisfies. But wisdom here looks and sounds an awful lot like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says, Luke 18, 29, having just sent away a rich man, by the way, who couldn't bring himself to trust in Jesus and let go of his wealth, Jesus says in Luke 18, 29, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So get wisdom. You remember the parables Jesus told about the hidden treasure, Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Get wisdom. Get that one thing that is of priceless, true, infinite value, despite what the world might say. So wisdom calls. How do you respond? You can't claim not to have heard the wisdom of God. Amid all the other voices that call out to us each day, the voice, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ is unmissable and unmistakable. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, the Lord Jesus Christ became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He is priceless. He is worth having more than anyone or anything else in this world. He is for the ordinary citizen, and he is for the rulers of the citizens. Listen to wisdom. Listen to the Lord Jesus when he says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. So seek him while he may be found and call upon him while he is near and calling upon you. Amen.